Okay, well, why, do, why don't we go ahead and begin? And um, our assignment for today, of course, was to finish Waverly. And the chapters that you were assigned, that we were assigned and agreed to discuss, are the, uh, the final volume of the novel, chapters 48 to the end. And uh, just as a reminder, when, when Waverly was originally published in 1814, it was published in three volumes, three, um, the, the form that is sometimes referred to as the three-decker novel. And so when, when we read it, uh, we, we need to be aware of where the volume breaks are, because when Scott was writing it, he, um, he, he was also aware of where the volume breaks were going to be. And so uh, for the final volume, what we, what we need to do is partly as a, as a reminder of uh, what comes immediately before, we should, we should think back to the end of volume two. And volume two, uh, volume one, ends with Waverly going to sleep. And I, I think I pointed that out the last time uh, that uh, when we were discussing volume one, because Waverly, although he's called our hero throughout the novel, is frequently asleep. <laughs> and I think that that's significant. And I think it's a piece of the comedy of of the novel, that, that Waverly is um, he's our hero, but he, he manages to miss a lot of the action of the world that he's living through. And um, so volume one ends with Waverly asleep, but volume two, by contrast, ends on a rather exciting note. It ends with the Battle of Preston, which is one of the early battles in the invasion in the rebellion. And it's a battle that uh, in which the Jacobite forces are victorious. So things start off on a, on a good uh, note for them. But for Waverly, there are some important things that happen in connection with that battle. And one of them is that we encounter the first death in the novel. In fact, we encounter two deaths in the Battle of Preston that are significant for Waverly. The first is the death of Sergeant Houghton. And Sergeant Houghton is one of the people who came from England, who came from Waverly Honor. He was uh, someone who, who lived and worked on the estate of uh, Sir Everard. And uh, we learn later on that Houghton and some of his, uh, his colleagues from England, from Waverly Honor, the people who came from Sir Everard's estate, had been encouraged to side with the Jacobites. And uh, they did so, at least in part, because they believed that they were being instructed to do so by Edward Waverley himself. And this goes back to the one of the little plot details early in the novel when Edward can't find his ring, his signet ring. And it was stolen from him by Donald Bain Lane. And Donald then uses that ring in order to forge letters that then uh, appear to be instructions from Edward to his soldiers to desert the English army and to join the rebellion. So um, Edward on the battlefield encounters Sergeant Houghton and Houghton is dying. It's the first death that, that Edward encounters. And um, it's Sergeant Houghton recognizes him and calls out to him and says to him, why did you leave us? Why did you desert us? And it's an important moment for Edward in his development because it's the first time that he experiences death in warfare. And it's also important because of the voice that 
Sergeant Houghton uh, uses to speak to him. He calls out in an English accent. And so it's England, it's the voice of England, it's the voice of his home that is calling out to him. And that is saying, why did you abandon us? Why did you leave us? And so it's a, it's a reproach. It's, it's, a, it's a lament, but it, indirectly it's a reproach to Edward. And then a little bit later, uh, again, during the battle, um, there's a second death. And it's the death of Captain Gardner. And Captain Gardner was the um, captain of the regiment in which Edward was a soldier. And Captain Gardner is one of the many father figures in the novel that Edward has. And Captain Gardner, you remember, had sent letters to Edward saying, um, you overstayed your leave in the Highlands. Uh, it's time for you to come back. And Edward doesn't respond because he doesn't receive the letter. And then there's a, another letter that's a more stern letter and uh, a reprimand and a command. And when Edward finally sees the, the letter from, uh, from Gardner, he, he's angry because he doesn't like being spoken to in, in such a uh, peremptory way. And, um, and yet when he sees Gardner on the battlefield and sees him die, he feels guilty. He feels that there is, it's, it's almost as if the father has died and he is in rebellion against the father and he feels guilty. So those two deaths occur. And then, then there's a third death at the end of volume two. And it's the death of Balmawapple. You remember who Balmawapple is? <laughs> um, back from early in the novel, he's the one who got into the argument with Edward uh, at uh, 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 Tully Vale and, and um, uh, there was a toast and Edward didn't drink the toast to the, uh, to the rebellion, uh, didn't, excuse me, didn't drink the, drink the toast to the king. And uh, that actually becomes part of the incriminating evidence that gets back to London about Edward is that uh, uh, he let someone else, he let the Baron of Bradwardine fight a duel uh, instead of fighting the duel himself. So uh, there are three deaths. And the last paragraph of volume two is interesting in another respect because it's the elegy for the death of Balma Whapple. And I don't know if you remember that scene. It's a, it's a kind of comic but grotesque moment in the book because the elegy for Balma Whapple, the third death that occurs uh, at the Battle of Preston, is spoken by Balma Whapple's groom, that is the man who takes care of his horses. And um, he says, I always told him not to ride that horse <laughs> the way he did. And uh, what's interesting about this is that it, it ends on a little bit of a comic note uh, and that the, the voice is given, uh, the, the elegy is given to one of the uh, minor characters. And one of the things that I'm interested in in the entire novel, in all through Waverly, is the way that Scott uses the minor characters. Uh, and I think we probably should talk about some of the minor characters. Uh, um, Scott, in particular, likes to give the voice to characters who are from the lower classes, the common people. Uh, one of the things that Scott is famous for is his uh, attention to uh, the common people, to the peasants. And frequently the peasant voice, the lower class voice is an important voice to pay attention to. So um, there are three deaths. Two of them are, uh, if you will, important points in Edward's realization about who he is. Uh, they're deaths of Englishmen. And then the third one is the death of Balmawapple, uh, a lowlands Scot, and um, it's 
rendered in sort of a comic fashion uh, because the narrator tells us that uh, uh, his head was cloven in two and that this proved that uh, despite the uh, belief to the contrary on the part of some people that Balmahuapo had a brain um, because his head was split in two. So it's a kind of comic uh, moment in, in a grotesque way. So that sets up volume three. So we now launch into volume three and uh, the main event, the, there, there's a new character who is introduced in volume three, um, someone we have not met before. And it's uh, in sort of the latter stage of the Battle of Preston and it's Talbot. Talbot is the Englishman. And you remember that uh, there's, a, there's a fight, uh, uh, Talbot and Edward fight. Talbot uses his sword, strikes at Edward, hits his target, that is his, his shield, and his sword breaks. And at that moment, Talbot is about to be slaughtered by one of the Scotsmen. And uh, Edward intervenes and Talbot surrenders. And according to the customs of the time, honorable fighting, uh, he then becomes the personal captive of Edward. Edward takes him captive and prevents him from being killed, in effect saves his life. And from that point on, Talbot is living with and he's given his honor that he won't escape. Um, and so uh, Edward now has Talbot as a kind of companion. And Talbot is important because Talbot, of course, is an Englishman and he thinks that the rebellion is a foolish uh, waste of time that Edward has uh, committed himself to a, a losing cause and that he's betrayed his, his, his country. So uh, it's, it's almost as if Talbot becomes a, um, a voice of conscience, a voice of conscience that is uh, working on Edward and trying to persuade him to change his political beliefs. And Talbot becomes increasingly important. Now, do you remember where Talbot first enters the novel? I said he shows up, he's a new character who shows up for the first time in volume three, but actually we know a little bit of backstory about Talbot. Does anyone remember how we first got to know who Talbot was? One of the pieces of backstory that we learned way early in, in volume one is that Sir Everard is a bachelor. And because he's a bachelor, he doesn't have any descendants. And so people wonder, people in the neighborhood, uh, whether he will ever marry. So he goes and he, he meets, uh, he knows of a young lady in the, in the neighborhood and he goes and he indicates to the parents that he wants to marry her. And she then reveals to him, the young woman, that she's in love with someone else. And Sir Everard being a gentleman says he will not force her to marry against her will. So he declines to pursue his suit and the lady then marries the, the man whom she loved. That man is Talbot. We learned that early in the novel. So one of the things that this means is that Talbot is indebted to the Waverley family, to Sir Everard in particular, and that debt transfers to some extent, to Edward. It means that Talbot has more than a, um, a military interest in, uh, in saving Edward and uh, persuading him to come to his senses and, uh, and um, repudiate the, the rebellion. So the next military event that happens in volume three is a minor battle. Um, to call it a battle isn't even 
correct. It's a skirmish. It's the skirmish at Clifton. Now, in the larger military history of the rebellion, the major battle, the decisive battle, the one that turns the rebellion away, is the Battle of Culloden. Um, and it's interesting that Scott chooses not to dramatize the Battle of Culloden. The important battle that he gives us, or the two important battles are first the, the victory, uh, the early victory at Preston, and then the fairly indecisive skirmish that takes place, place at Clifton. Um, and uh, Clifton, uh, it's, it's another place where Edward um, uh, um, doesn't exactly fall asleep, but he gets lost. Again, you have to appreciate the comedy of what happens to, to Edward, because the, uh, what's, what's happening at Clifton is that the, uh, um, the, uh, uh, the, the Scotsmen plan a nighttime attack, but Edward gets separated from the other forces. Ed, Edward is now uh, dressed in, um, in plaid, He's, he's in effect in the, um, uh, the rebellion, the army of the rebellion. He's accepted uh, the sword that uh, the prince has given him, uh, Charles Edward, Bonnie Prince Charlie. And um, uh, he, but he gets lost <laughs> and he doesn't, he doesn't fight. He just wanders around in the dark. Um, and then a voice calls out to him, Edward, is it thou? And it's an English voice. Again, like the scene with Houghton. Um, and um, uh, it's an English family that lives in that vicinity. And the voice that he hears is a woman's voice. And she is, has, uh, she's a young woman who has a lover whose name is Ned, Edward, the same name as, uh, as our hero. And she calls out, Edward, is it thou? And um, of course, it's a confusion of identities, but it's also Edward's English identity that is being hailed, that's being summoned by an English voice. So I think what's happening thematically in the novel is that England is calling out to Edward, first in the voice of uh, Sergeant Houghton, and then in the voice of, what's her name, Sicily or something like that, uh, who's out meeting her lover, um, Edward. And his answer to, you know, Edward, is it thou, is interesting um, because he, he meets her father, he's taken in by them, and because they, uh, don't uh, side with the rebellion. They uh, take him in, they shield him, and they hide him. And he says, no, I'm an unfortunate Englishman who has lost his way. So again, you know, Edward, is it thou? No, I'm an unfortunate Englishman who has lost his way. So Edward is gradually coming into possession, I think, of his English identity. So Talbot is there encouraging him as uh, the phrase that Talbot uses is, is, is interesting. He says, unplaid yourself, take off uh, the plaid, take off the tartan, um, cease to uh, occupy that identity, that Scottish identity that you have, have taken on. And from that point on, uh, gradually, Edward uh, moves away from his uh, identity as a Scotsman and his connection with uh, the rebellion. There's an argument, he gets into an argument with Fergus. Uh, there's a moment where um, uh, Callum Begg, who is Edward's servant, uh, not Edward's servant, Fergus's servant, 
actually takes a shot at him, tries to kill him because he's loyal to, uh, to Fergus. And um, there's, a, there's a turning point where Edward, Edward has to spend several weeks, maybe it's as much as a month, with the English family of um, the, the young woman who, who saved him. And the narrator tells us that Edward began to ponder his relationship to the rebellion and that the romance of his life had ended and its real history had begun. And that's a, a crucial turning point because it pits two um, terms, two important terms uh, against each other. One is romance and the other is history. Um, and Edward, as we know from early on, is someone who has been reading the Italian romances, the Renaissance uh, literature that he has studied and uh, from which he has gotten his ideas about um, warfare. But now he has actually encountered war and he has encountered death and he has seen the consequences of war. And war is ugly, war is destructive, and Edward can no longer hold on to his romantic ideas about war and about heroism. And he begins to align himself with a more realistic view of the world, which is the world of history, the reality of history. So romance on the one hand and history on the other, Scott, as we know, is writing a historical novel. So the plot of the novel, the larger plot of the novel, we could say, is Edward's movement into alignment with history. Edward has been mistaken about history. The rebellion, uh, Charles Edward, Bonnie Prince Charlie, Fergus, uh, uh, the invasion, is an attempt to reverse the tide of history, to go back to the Stuart monarchy, to go back to turn history back on itself. And uh, one of the things that's, that's most important, I think, in understanding why Waverley is such an important novel is that it introduces the notion of the relationship between the individual life and the larger patterns of history. So what is the, the theory? What is the, the concept of history that this novel has to offer us? Um, and it's something that we don't really get a clear view of. It's, it's built through the experience that Edward goes through, but it's, it's something that becomes finally clear, I think, in the voice of the narrator in the final chapter of the novel, the postscript that should have been a preface as the, the narrator sort of jokingly says. And the theory of history that underlies the novel is a theory of history that was developed in Scotland during the 18th century in the universities. And it's a theory that Scott, uh, who went to the university, was familiar with. And that's a theory that is uh, uh, sometimes called the stadial theory of history. That's S-T-A-D-I-A-L. And it's, it's a theory that history develops through stages. And so that's why it's called stadial. And that the history of humankind goes through a progression from hunter-gatherers to nomadic herdsmen, to agricultural societies, and eventually to commercial societies. When people learn how to trade, when, when commerce develops, commerce between nations, commerce between different people, that's the modern world. And in Waverly, in the novel Waverly, the narrator endorses that view of history. And Edward, by taking sides with the rebellion, by taking sides with the attempt to turn history back to a, a more primitive era, 
is going against the tide of history. So the benefits of living in the modern world, the narrator tells us in the final chapter, is that there is commerce, there is improvement in the standard of living. Scotland is a more peaceful, uh, more thriving world. Uh, it's people like Bailey McWeeble, the Bailey, uh, the, the magistrate who's uh, a comic character, but who's the, uh, a voice of the law, that the law has replaced military warfare as a way of settling disputes. So it's, the, the novel is eventually about the triumph of law and about the securing of property. And the final movement of Waverley, um, as you probably noticed, has to do with the restitution of property to its proper owner or to, to its, its rightful owner. And the crucial piece of property that's in dispute is Tully Valen, and that's the Baron of Bradwardine's property. And you remember that the Baron of Bradwardine has a property problem. <laughs> um, he uh, has left his property. He, has, um, he does not have a male heir. He has only a daughter, Rose Bradwardine. But because he believes, and his society believes, that property should be handed down in the male line. He has deeded his property off upon his death to a Malcolm Bradwardine of Inchgrabbit. It's one, one of those wonderful comic names that um, Scott uses and Dickens uh, follows him in uh, being inventive with the names, Balmawapple, Macweeble, um, uh, and so on. Um, and because he has deeded his land to inch grab it, when the Baron joins the rebellion, his property would, under normal circumstances, be subject to expropriation by the British state. But because he is declared illegal as an owner, the ownership of Tully Valen now is in the hands of Inch, Inch Grabbit. And Inch Grabbit is an Englishman who sided with the Whig government in, uh, uh, in, in London. So Inch Grabbit is now the owner of Tully Vale. <laughs> um, but uh, Inch Grabbit is scared off from taking possession of his property. Uh, because uh, the local Scotsman, uh, Bailey McQueeble in particular, says, oh, you don't want to own that property. Uh, there are lots of uh, bandits in the neighborhood. Um, they're, uh, they're likely to steal your cows. And if I were you, I would sell your property. So Inchcrabbit agrees to sell his property. Who buys it? Talbot. Talbot buys it, but Talbot is indebted to Sir Everard and to Edward's family. And so Talbot, uh, together with his wife, restores Tully Valen to the way that it was before, and then gives it back to the Baron of Bradwardine. So the property comes back to its rightful owner. And uh, there are also property settlements that uh, occur simultaneously with that. Uh, one of them is that now uh, the Baron deeds his property to his daughter. And since Edward is going to marry Rose Bradwardine, um, Edward will come into ownership eventually of Tully Valen. And Edward is also the heir to Sir Everard at Waverley Honor. So Edward will now have two estates. And there's one other estate that is um, discussed in the ending of the novel. And that's um, Briarwood Manor. And you may remember that Briarwood Manor is the estate or was the estate of Richard Waverley, Edward's father. 
But who has bought Briarwood Manor? Mr. Talbot. Mr. Talbot is the agent for lots of the um, plot manipulations that are taking place at the end of, of the novel. So uh, uh, Talbot is now going to take up residence at Briarwood Manor, which is in the neighborhood of Waverly Honor, uh, which is one of the estates that will eventually belong to, to Edward. So part of the happy ending of the novel and part of the way in which history is reasserting itself is that property ownership is now straightened out. Properties belong to the right person, that is the morally correct person, and its pro property is prevented from falling into the hands of people who don't have a right to, to own it. So commerce is triumphant. Edward is a happy man because he gets to marry Rose Bradwire Dean. Um, and uh, uh, Edward now finds his proper identity as a, uh, an English gentleman who has memories of his time in the rebellion, but who uh, has, has, has not gone over to the side of the rebellion. He's a law abiding citizen and um, he guards, he, he keeps one piece of memorabilia from his time in the rebellion. And it's an important detail, again, at the end of, of the, the novel. And it's a painting. And it's a painting of Edward and Fergus in their tartan, in their plaid uniforms. And it's painted by a, a London painter. And it hangs in the house at, at Tully Valen um, alongside some weapons that Edward has obtained that were weapons rescued from the battlefield. So Edward now has a souvenir. Uh, he has two souvenirs. He has a set of, of weapons that are reminders of his time in the military, and he has a portrait. But a portrait is in a frame and it hangs on a wall. And it's very different from being a soldier on the battlefield. So Edward is able to be nostalgic about the past. He has positive memories of Fergus and of his time in the rebellion, but he's safely protected from any actual contact with dangerous political or military forces. So Edward, who began his life as a something of a naive tourist who went sightseeing in Scotland, now comes back to England and is, if not exactly a tourist, he's um, the equivalent of a tourist, a nostalgic uh, 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 reader of literature, not too different from the um, uh, the way that he began his life. And he's married, of course, the proper uh, woman, Rose Bradwardine, uh, instead of Flora, the, uh, the fanatic look, Flora, who is the uh, idealist, but whose commitment to the, um, the world of the past, to the, uh, to the Stuart monarchy and to the, the Highlands culture uh, is an inappropriate mate for a man of the modern world. So the moral of Waverly, the moral uh, of the story as a whole, is that it's best to align yourself with the proper forces of history uh, and to settle down comfortably into an English estate rather than to rebel and try and turn history back upon itself. Now, one of the things that I'm interested in having your ideas about is the role of the minor characters. Um, and one of them is Rose. Um, Rose turns out to have played a more important role in the story than you thought. Another is the Baron of Bradwardine. I'm interested in what you think about his role at the end of the novel. 
Um, Talbot, I've already said a little bit about, but we might want to say more about, uh, about Talbot. Davy Galatly is another minor character. His mother, Janet Galatly, is another minor character uh, in the novel. Um, so those are um, some things that I thought it would be useful for us to discuss. Uh, I want to reserve some time at the end of our uh, discussion period today to talk about the connections between Waverly and David Copperfield. Because the way that we got into reading Waverly was that I said that I thought there were important relationships between Waverly and David Copperfield. And so I, I have some thoughts about that that I'd like to share with you. But I don't want to do that until we've sort of finished our discussion of, of Waverly and of volume three. So um, I'll turn it open for, for questions or comments. Uh, I, I'm interested in minor characters, uh, uh, but really anything that you have to say about the, the way in which the novel uh, concludes. So raise, raise your hands if you want to comment. Yes, Brad. Uh, you know, this is wonderful, and I'm so grateful. I I had a question about, as you've been wrapping the novel up, I wondered if you thought this, as you stated early on, was perhaps um, the inception of the modern novel, or or at least a model for the modern novel as it comes into being, even though perhaps Tom Jones might have been influential. Do you think, or do, what do you think the motivation was? was is this... Uh, is this is this the beginning of a form that was written as a commercial venture or as an artistic venture? Um, was this novelist trying to be artistic, or was this art or was this novelist trying to be successful in creating a successful genre of commerce? Or I'm trying to negotiate that that in between of art and commerce and and how you might find this particular man and as a beginning a beginning artist of a form where where he falls in that line um good question interesting question and uh rather than an either or i think it's a both and um but uh let's let's back up a little bit scott's reputation was as a poet and he was a very successful poet uh the novel at this time was by most people considered as a low form of art, a vulgar, a vulgar form. So when Scott started, when he, when he published this novel, he didn't use his own name. And it was uh, uh, un published anonymously. And he kept up that pretense. And one of the reasons that he kept up that pretense was that um, he didn't want to be, he was known as a poet, which was a, uh, Poetry is a high form of art. Uh, the novel is a low form. He didn't want to be associated with, with turning out low forms of art. But one of the things that he learned was that he had created a bestseller. It was a commercial success. And he kept churning out these historical novels, um, uh, one a year <laughs> almost. And they were tremendously successful. So. He was, he was getting a lot of income. Eventually he got into trouble with, uh, with his publishers and went bankrupt, but that's a, that's a separate story. So it's, uh, it's a commercial venture for him. And in the preface and also in the, um, the, um, the concluding chapter, he says, he tells a story about how he began writing Waverly. And he says, I wrote the first few chapters and it was so bad, I just couldn't look at it anymore. And so I tucked it away, I, g I gave up on it. And it was only some years later when I was looking for my fishing tackle, <laughs> I discovered the manuscript of this novel and I decided I would continue it. Now we know from other historical fact that that story is not true. It's a story that Scott sort of fabricated or sort of made up. Um, 
And I think it's part of his pretense that he wasn't trying to create a work of art. This is something that he did sort of as a sport. It's like fishing. It's, you know, his fishing tackle and his novel, the manuscript of his novel, were stored in the same place because neither one was serious as a work of art. But I think that that's also a fabrication. I think that Waverly is a work of art. It's very carefully crafted. Uh, some of these details, like the way that Talbot is, uh, is, is mentioned at the very beginning, or another detail, um, the Baron of Bradwardine, uh, we learn very early in the novel, uh, had saved Janet Delatley from being accused as a witch. It turns out later on that Janet Galatley, Davy Galatley's mother, is the person who saves the Baron of Bradwardine when he's hiding. He's got a cave in the hills. Nice. She's the one who brings him food and takes care of him. And um, So there are lots of ways in which I think this is a very carefully crafted artistic novel. And um, and Scott is sort of downplaying the artfulness of it in order not to be too obvious that he actually takes it seriously. So it's a commercial success that he's pursuing because he wants the commercial success, but it's also a work of art. And as um, we said when we started studying this novel, it's, it's one that is tremendously influential in the history of the modern novel, that you wouldn't have War and Peace, you wouldn't have uh, James Fenimore Cooper. <laughs> um, uh, Was this the first bestseller, quote unquote? Some people make that argument, yeah. I mean, he certainly Dickens, some people say Dickens was the, you know, the first uh, bestseller, author of, of bestsellers. But he looked to Scott because Scott was the author in the world of fiction who had had the greatest commercial success prior to him. Certainly Fielding never had that kind of, um, you know, Richardson to some extent, but, um, you know, yeah. it's really with Scott that the <clears throat> novel becomes the popular form. <clears throat> So that was a long answer to a good question. Oh, good. I, I, yeah. Thank you. I'm interested in another aspect. Yes. You, other than what you mentioned, and that is to what extent Scott is responsible for changing the view of Scottish history. Because by, as you said at the beginning, he focuses on two less important battles and almost completely ignores the important one of Culloden, and he totally ignores the aftermath of Culloden. And he gives, therefore, an English view of the history of that period and not a Scottish view, even though he is a Scotsman. But maybe because the Lowlanders never did really support Bonnie Prince Charlie and the rebellion, uh, he, he is able to take on the Lowland Scots view of what happened to Scotland at that time and the way in which Scottish culture was totally destroyed afterwards. Well, again, it's, it's a complicated answer. I mean, uh, some people say that Scott is responsible for the invention of Scotland um, because Scotland, after people read the Waverley <laughs> novel, became an important tourist destination. And they wanted the to go for, for the England. English. For it's England, an English of course. perspective on Scotland. But I would say, I would say, but you know, you, you and I, Irene, went <laughs> around on this once before. I would say it's a British, it's a British view of Scotland, because the argument, uh, the his, the larger historical argument, is in support of uh, the Act of Union. It's the act of union that forms Scotland as, that includes Scotland as part of a unified Great Britain. So but Scotland, we've seen recently that something that's up for grabs again. It's, it's, it's for many it years it's been at risk certainly, again. It certainly is up for grabs. I mean, um, we, <laughs> see, we see all around the world uh, nationalisms, uh, um, 
Um, you know, we we experience nationalism in in our own country at this, at yes. this particular moment. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I, you know, is Scott fair? Does he take an English view? And Talbot certainly takes an English view of Fergus and of the rebellion. But I think toward the end of the novel, one of the things that happens is that the narrator who by and large is is judgmental i think of fergus fergus is is often associated by the narrator with lucifer with with the devil i mean uh, you know we we learn about the ways in which fergus is restored um, though by the end yeah uh what by oh. the end what? <laughs> sorry i thought i was muted <laughs> no um, I, I was going to say that Fergus is quite restored by the end. Fergus is, his quite, is Scottish noble, noble. He, he's he is, he is given a heroic death. Um, oh he, yes. He he goes to the scaffold. It's it's something that might even make you think of the end of a tale of two cities in in, in mm. some respects. Um, but. Uh, he, the, the, the concluding, the trial of Fergus. Fergus stands up for what he believes in, and there's the wonderful scene with Evan Dew, his, his lieutenant, who, who first offers to substitute himself and six Highlanders if, if, they, if the judge would let um, them be executed and spare Fergus. So Evan Dew is, is a wonderful example of clan loyalty. And clan loyalty is part of the primitive society of the Highlands, primitive in, in quotes, because that's yeah. the way that the, the modern perspective, the, the historical perspective that thinks in terms of stages of development. The Highlands are in a primitive state of development. Um, and Scotland will improve uh, its welfare uh, by joining England becoming part of the larger commercial empire. That's the, I think, the, the argument that the narrator That's has. the one I would disagree with because for Scotland, that uh, the aftermath of Culloden was the equivalent of the Irish potato famine. It did, yeah. uh, it, it destroyed most of Scotland in the same way that the potato famine destroyed England. Big yeah. part destroyed Ireland. <laughs> destroyed Ireland. And, and, and you're correct. I'm not arguing about uh, historical reality, I'm arguing about the view that the novel takes. Oh yeah, that, that's what I'm saying, is that's why yeah. I'm saying it, it's an English perspective, or a possibly British. a Hollander British. perspective. <laughs> <but not. laughs> no, no, you can't equate England and Britain, that's the whole point. England and, Brit England and Scotland are two separate countries, where then still are. Britain is, <laughs> and, and isn't England and Scotland, it's, it includes Northern Ireland and Wales. I, I don't think you can say it's a Brit, it's an English perspective. Um, this particular book is, is very much to do with Scotland and England and whether they should be com compatriots or not. And Scotland is in this instance and really now a completely different nation. I mean, there are ties and all the rest of it, but um, the, the, pr the story that was told on the BBC Scotland was that basically Waverley, he was looking for a way, initially he was very pro-British, and then it changed and he became enamoured with Scotland, and then he felt that his loyalties needed to end up back as British, and obviously he was wonderfully confused. Um, according to the British, you know, and this was really, this was a Scottish program for BBC Scotland that I was watching on the book itself. So that was their spin. That, that, I, that's the kind of confusion I'm seeing there as well. This is a Scotsman <laughs> to some extent betraying his Scottish heritage in the way in which he pictures <laughs> the, the, the happenings of that time. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'll, I'll bet his publishers were English. <laughs> they were, no. definitely, yes. And I would believe that that's where the market was. The, the market it's was nice. English writers. His publishers were Scottish. Really? He, yes. His publishers were Scottish, but they were located in Edinburgh and they were part of the uh, international commercial enterprise. 
And so they were benefiting from the, uh, this fantastic Scottish product that was now exported to English readers and to readers around the world. So Scotland was entering the, the, the world commercial system and Scott was a part of it. But I'm gonna recognize David uh, Brownell, who has his hand. Okay. And oh, then Glenna. I think Scott always has a double perspective. He has sympathy with the losing cause as well as the winning one. Uh, in this case, his idea of the book he's writing is interesting. If you had said to anybody in 1814, there's a new book that's come out about the 1745 rebellion, and they hadn't heard anything about it, they would say, oh, you mean Prince Charlie's escape? Because this was the story everybody knew. For five months after the Battle of Culloden, Prince Charles was a hunted man going across Scotland. The English had put a 30,000 pound reward for turning him in. About a hundred different people knew who he was in the course of his escape and nobody turned him in. And it's full of exciting moments such as a woman named Flora MacDonald uh, traveling with him, with him dressed as her servant. And she ended up, she and her husband ended up in North Carolina where they picked the wrong side again and became loyalists in the American Revolution and lost everything. Having grown up in North Carolina, I can't resist that. But <laughs> Scott bails out of the rebellion before it goes down to defeat and isn't at all interested in Prince Charlie. He sees it as the beginning of the unification of Britain, that point uh, John pointed out already, the postscript, which should have been a preface. There's no European nation with, which within the course of half a century or a little more has undergone so complete a change as this kingdom of Scotland. And as Irene was saying, the aftermath of the, of the loss of the rebellion's cause was pretty brutal. The English army was commanded by the Duke of Cumberland, who was one of the king's sons. He was known as Billy the Butcher to many. He turned his troops pretty much loose and they punished the Scots, whether they'd had anything to do with the rebellion or not. Scott talks about this in some detail in a book he wrote in his old age for his grandson called Tales of a Grandfather. He avoids using the word rape, but it's clear that's what he means. <laughs> rape and pillage and the destruction of the, the Highland clan system. But he sees the story as one of the restoration of order, repairing the ravages of the war, rebuilding Bradwardine's house with all its monuments. And one other point uh, to mention in connection with this is that the, the novel has a marriage plot and the marriage between Edward and Rose Bradwardine is a symbolic marriage uh, in which the two nations are, are reconciled. And, and Rose actually turns out to be a fairly important character in, in the novel. She, she has saved Edward's life, it turns out. Um, but uh, Glenna, you were, you were going to make a comment. Yes, <clears throat> I wanted to say a couple of things. First, in response to what Brad said about, is this the first bestseller? Richardson, I don't know the extent to which he was a commercial success, but he was an international phenomenon. Um, and I, I've always loved the quotation from the French philosophe 
Diderot who said that Richardson had taken a lantern into the cave that is the human heart. I mean, it was a huge thing that he had explored emotion. And my personal favorite is that John Adams said at the time of the American Revolution, the people are Clarissa. In other words, the British crown was like Clarissa's parents and, and Clarissa and the uh, American people were Clarissa. But I also wanted to say in terms of um, the art, one thing that struck me when I was reading it was the way that the narrative is the narrator, at first you think he's really siding with the Scots. I mean, it's a very interesting, subtle shift in point of view so that, you know, you get the, the whether English or British, I will leave to people who are, That's a match. <laughs> who are more expert than I. But um, anyhow, at first he seems to present um, Edward Waverley's choices, uh, you know, and, and attraction to Fergus and, and the beautiful Flora in very positive terms. And then you begin to get a darker view. And so it's not just a straightforward uh, narrator, I think. And that also bespeaks the fact that he had a fairly complicated idea that he's trying to express. Uh, can yes, I say I, something? Yes. Who was <laughs> it's, it's me, Sita. Yes, yes it's Sita. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I just want to just go inside the, the novel uh, as a reader that I, you know, get in there with uh, not a drop of erudition, you understand, but uh, with a human heart and a head. And uh, you can follow Waverly's course. I mean, yes, Waverly's Edwards course, metaphorically from the beginning to the end, but a metaphor that does express the evolution of, um, I won't call it a fantasy, but with toying with ideas or being attracted here or there, the evolution and youth, the evolution of that to the recognition of the true home, your true home and who you are, that is. And I just found that very lovely, but I, had, I wasn't thinking about it in terms of political perspective. I was just in there with my little old heart and head, and I, um, <laughs> <laughs> and I just loved how he evolves. And um, of course, I love Talbot. Of course, I have English heritage. Well, I have Scottish heritage too. Anyway, um, so I just want to say that it's damn righteous a popular novel because <laughs> you just get right in there, and it was wonderful, and it did just. Out of the clear blue sky, it reminded me a lot of uh, the Dickens perspective on society, too, although he's a little bit more in your face with it. <laughs> it's, it is very much a, a novel of growing up. I'll, I'll, Luca, when I finish this response, I'll ask you to speak. Um, it's, it's a novel about growing up. I mean, Edward is, is young and naive and he comes to a more realistic understanding of his relationship to the world. Uh, he learns that he made an incorrect love choice in falling in love with, with Flora, and that Rose is a much more appropriate mate for him. Um, it's, it's both a symbolic union of uh, uh, you know, the two countries, but it's also uh, a, a proper choice emotionally for him. And, uh, so yes, I think we can follow the story of Edward's growth and development and see this as a, as a buildings roman, as a growing up from um, naive and sentimental romance notions based on literature to a more realistic understanding of the world after you've had a little bit of experience. So, Luca. Oh, okay. Yes, uh, I was just saying uh, good night to my wife because uh, it's midnight here in Italy. Anyway, um, in, uh, before we were talking about uh, uh, Scots and politics, uh, politics, the importance of Scott in uh, the unification of the actual Great Britain and the separation between 
Scotland and England and the question of Scottish independence. Uh, I'd just like uh, to underline the importance uh, that Scott, uh, Scott novels had uh, for uh, the unification of Italy and uh, the fact uh, that uh, Walter Scott with uh, his novel starting from uh, uh, Waverly uh, inspired uh, uh, the Italian independent uh, novelists and all the Italian uh, Risorgimento, all the Italian independence uh, movement. So uh, he has been very important under this point of view. And he has been uh, the most uh, translated, published, censored author during the 20s, 1820s, 1830s uh, year. So it uh, has been analyzed uh, mainly under this point of view. He promised his posy. He promised his posy was uh, uh, made is a sort of patchwork of uh, Walter Scott uh, uh, novels. We have uh, something from Waverley, something from uh, the monastery, and uh, something for, uh, from Fenimore Cooper too, but mostly from uh, Walter Scott. This just goes to the point that um, we mentioned early on that this is perhaps the most influential novel in yeah. the history of the modern novel. In, 2000, in 1827, uh, there has been a publication made for, by a critic uh, of uh, Austrian persuasion mm -hmm. uh, who censored the Promessi Sposi and Walter Scott novel. And there's a pamphlet against Walter Scott. <laughs> Carolyn, were you raising a hand? No, sorry. No. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Any, any other hands raised to, yes, Robert. Yeah, I would just, just have gone a little bit on the minor character that ties into this for the Baron. I'm just looking right at the beginning of chapter 13. Now just, just very quickly, it says, talking about the Baron and Edward, where yet they met upon history as on a neutral ground. And the Baron is cumbered with memory, uh, focuses on matter of fact, the cold, dry, hard outlines of history. And Edward, on the other hand, he loved to fill up and round the sketch with coloring of a warm and vivid imagination, which gives light and life to the actors and speakers in the drama of uh, past ages. So I like as I, I liked him as a minor character. I think he he speaks to this. Uh, conflict between history and romance that you mentioned that passage at the end of chapter 60 uh, where Edward seems to suggest he's going to give up romance now he must accept history but the last sentence when he, he says that he's going to have to justify his pretensions about the split and I think uh, the novel tends to show that there isn't it's very difficult to split or to come up, have a clear cut split between romance and history. And the Baron gives us this view of history. I mean, Fergus, right, always rolls his eyes when the Baron, because, uh, you know, he's, he's always quoting, right, these abstruse texts uh, all the time. And, uh, and yet at the novel seems to suggest, um, again, back to all the comments that this is a history, yet uh, it also is at the same time, uh, including romance. And I was just, I was really ultimately thinking of Hayden White's meta history, where he looks at the, the idea that history, the language of history is never neutral and the meaning doesn't inherit in facts. How we, inter how we understand the rebellion, the meaning of the rebellion isn't inherent in the facts, the historical facts, it's how the story is told. The narrator tells us the story. For White, it could be on the one is the romance plot, the hero transcending the world, but the other trope he uses is of course the ironic. And it, at times it, you're suggesting, the comments suggest that. So I just, as a minor character, I think he's interesting in, in reinforcing that split. And that passage that, that you read is, is interesting because you could say that the novel as a whole 
is a combination of Edward's perspective, which is imagination, and the Baron's, which is, which is more grounded in history. And Scott's novel is a blend of, of, the, of the two. And he, he ultimately, I think, does take um, uh, a, an ironic perspective on, to, to use White's terminology, uh, on, on history or uh, on, on the development of history. It's an interpretation, which is to say that it doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't other interpretations. I mean, Irene's reading um, is, is, a, is a, a reading of history. Um, and we would, you know, perhaps read it differently. And Scott himself in other novels is more sympathetic to uh, the, if you will, the resistance to the imposition of, of English domination. And, um, you know, even at the end of this novel, I think the Baron, some people have argued that the Baron is the real hero of this novel, that the, the, the Baron in, um, uh, uh, when, when he goes and hides in the cave and comes out, the Baron, when he's at the, um, he leads a prayer ceremony before the, the Battle of Preston, is really a very admirable character. And in some ways, he's a comic character. He's, he's, he's got his uh, obsession with uh, the classics, and he's always quoting classical literature, um, Livy in particular. And uh, he also has his obsession with the proper procedure to put the, um, the shoe on the king's foot. Um, and it's, he's, he's a pedant. He's a, um, you know, but he's a lovable pedant, and he he comes out at the end, I think, as someone who is admirable and perhaps more truly deserving of the title hero than Edward is. I think whenever uh, the narrator uses the term "our hero," it's always slightly tongue in cheek, um, because Edward is always falling asleep or getting lost in the dark and. Uh, he never does anything heroic, uh, in my opinion, uh, except the time when he uh, prevents uh, Talbot from being killed at the battle. I'm, I'm interested just too in this idea of long, long form storytelling and the beginnings of it um, and wondered if uh, because this, this this really this really was I guess the form um, until probably and, and you, I'm sure you know better than I but to the Sherlock Holmes models or the types of episodic models that came later on um, where they were little little storylets of form and character I wondered would you say or would you guys would you guys or you ladies think that the prototype of the early novels were coming of age stories not in so much stories about the actual coming of age, but how the coming of age becomes, we become through them, we sort of follow them into their awakenings of the world uh, that actually follow the form of the novel's awakening to the reader. Is that a, a question that, that has any resonance? David. I'd say that a lot of what happens in the 18th century novel is the story of a young man finding his social place. The happy ending is it's established that he is in fact a gentleman with landed property. This doesn't work for Richardson, but it's certainly uh, Fielding and Smollett. Although Smollett sends it up in uh, Humphrey Clinker. Well, property does make us live happily ever after, doesn't it? <laughs> well, depends. <laughs> but I think you're 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 on to something, Brad, about uh, Scott establishing the long form narrative in a way that will um, prevail through the 19th century and into the early 20th century as well. Um, and 
it certainly has its roots in Tom Jones and in, in, in Smollett, and you can even trace it back to chivalric romance, which often have a, a knight errant who's uh, on a quest and passes through various tests and arrives at some um, conclusion, some satisfactory conclusion. Um, but Scott turns it into prose and Scott turns it into a vernacular language. We haven't talked about Scott's use of, of dialect, which, uh, and I mentioned his use of lower class characters. I mean, I think that that's, that's something that's, that's very important uh, as well. So, and he also, and this is the thing for which he's best known, is, is grounding it in a specific historical setting. It's not a, uh, you know, once upon a time in a land far away. It's, uh, it's, it's grounded. And, and, and remember all those footnotes that, you know, the end notes that accompany Waverly, which are attempts to, to ground this in fact, um, uh, to, to have at least a, a toehold in documentary history that gives it that kind of realism. Yes, Victoria. Sorry. Um, I just think that really and truly the novel needed to come out and it was at its very beginning of life and you've really got the beginning of Jane Austen and you've got a whole load of other people lining up behind. And so he laid down the groundwork and he was highly popular, highly read. I mean, it, it's almost like Harry Potter. <laughs> when you think about the enthusiasm with which everybody suddenly started writing books about magic because it was the in thing and we were all so excited. And it's hardly surprising that a whole new form of literature went in at the same time as people are beginning to think about themselves. And you're thinking of the French Revolution where people were rethinking the status quo um, to a very negative outcome, of course, but that deeply affected the Brits because they were desperately concerned about the fact that that revolution could come across and be part of England. And so all of this writing and development that, that came along is very interesting. I don't know if you've read the diary of Fanny Burney. I've always found that fascinating because she was writing at the time of what we in England call your civil war and you do not. Um, and I hope you'll forgive me, but it's very interesting to see how the characterization develops because she was writing about life um, in, in the court itself, which she hated intensely. And so you've got all of that development and really the whole stage was set for this phenomenal outpouring of writing by Dickens and the love of, of the things that he wrote in the paper and the way he made money, the whole thing it was like it was ignited into it. Yes, Karen. I, uh, to Victoria's point about how, what huge bestsellers these were, I joined a recent webinar with Simon Sharma, mm. uh, the historian oh, and art historian who just did a wonderful series not yet available in the United States on the BBC on romanticism. But he made a major point of saying and going over the fact that Sir Walter Scott was the absolute best seller in America pre and post Civil War. Nobody could come close to him. And, you know, a lot of it had to do with the themes of uh, the way things had been and they were now no longer like that. The South had been defeated. But he seemed a bit perplexed and disappointed that Scott isn't taught about more and read more currently. But um, the fact that he was this gigantic, gigantic bestseller in this country pre and post Civil War is really- I, I had to read Ivanhoe at school, but I belong to a lost generation who, I mean, you know, come on, this is years ago when we had colonies and God knows what else. And I'm not telling you it's good. I'm just trying to give you a perspective how out of date that is. And I think the book itself is out of date. And if we're into multiculturalism, it's difficult to stick at Walter Scott 
and not tread on toes. <laughs> Let me just say, Karen, that Harriet Beecher Stowe was a bigger seller in this country. Uncle Tom's Cabin was oh, the best-selling right. novel in the United States in the 19th century. And that novel, too, traveled around the world. I'm not saying that that novel had the literary influence of Walter Scott, but um, that novel was read in Russia, in Thailand, as, as it then was Siam, and, you know, just France, England. It, it was immensely important. But in this country, it was the best-selling novel in the 19th century. It's very cool. David. Oh agreeing with Glenna, one of the things about Walter Scott's popularity in this country in Life on the Mississippi, Mark Twain suggests that Walter Scott was really responsible for the American Civil War because all these Southerners, most of whom were really nouveau riche, uh, interpreted themselves as the aristocracy and saw themselves as much superior to the Northerners. They modeled themselves on the Scott aristocrats. This is partly tongue in cheek on Twain's part, but there's something to it. I wanted to, to make a slightly separate point. Um, going back to the postscript, the final chapter of the, of the novel, and um, about the historical context for the publication, the writing and publication of, of Waverly. And we've talked about it in relation to um, the different stages of, of development, the civilization, the theory of history that uh, the Scottish Enlightenment advanced. But another important context for this is the Napoleonic Wars and the American and French revolutions. So I want to read just a, a few passages from the, uh, the concluding chapter of the novel where, uh, and some of this David was already uh, referring to, but it's about gradual change and the use of the law as a way of, of settling disputes as opposed to warfare. So the gradual influx of wealth and extension of commerce have since united to tender the present, to render the present people of Scotland a class of beings as different from their grandfathers as the existing English are from those of Queen Elizabeth's time. The political and economic effects of these changes have been traced by Lord Selkirk with great precision and accuracy. But the change, though steadily and rapidly progressive, has nevertheless been gradual. Now that word gradual is important. It's gradual change brought about through commerce as opposed to sudden change brought about through revolution. So this is Scott is really thinking about the American Revolution and the French Revolution here. He's against, he's opposed to revolutions. So he goes on and says, um, such of the present generation as, as, re as can recollect the last 20 or 25 years of the 18th century will be fully sensible of the truth of this statement. So the last 20 or 25 years of the 18th century are the years of the American and French revolutions. And that's the backdrop for the writing of, of this novel. Scott is very much opposed to violence, to revolution, to sudden change. He prefers gradual change. And that's the view of history. That's the argument that he is presenting. Um, it's his interpretation of the way that history operates and the way that it should operate. And um, when, we, when we think of this as a historical novel, I think someone asked early on, were people still uh, at, in 1814 um, thinking that the Stuart monarchy should be restored? Well, there were a few you know, people who, who, who held that belief. 
but this is really about the French Revolution and the American Revolution and the scene in which Edward comes back to Tully Vale and, and sees how the Baron's estate has been devastated by the soldiers, by the English soldiers, not by the, the Scots, um, is really a, a replay of a scene from Edmund Burke's uh, history of the French Revolution, not history, but his uh, remarks on the, on, the, on the French Revolution and the, the devastation of Marie Antoinette's boudoir, that in invasion of the, of the Queen's apartments um, and Rose Bradwardine's boudoir has been invaded by the soldiers and the house has been destroyed. And Scott thinks that's terrible. The house of Bradwardine is something that needs to be restored and then preserved. Uh, so. A real affecting, oh, I'm butting in again. Yes, go ahead. Um, I was particularly struck when those British, those English soldiers blew up the old oak tree. I mean, yes. God, it was that, the way that is described uh, made me, made me come to terms with cruelty and death. A tree. And, yeah. and, and that, that tree, which is split in two, is the Civil War. I mean, it's, it's the rebellion. It's the English Civil War. Scott does not support splitting things in two. He, he believes in unification and restoration. And that tree is a symbolic tree. Um, so very good observation. Any other comments about, about the novel that people would like to, to make? Yes, Glennon. I just wanted to say, apropos of what David had been saying, that I recently, in Googling, learned that Jefferson Davis, after the Civil War, made a pilgrimage to Culloden, <laughs> which I think is a telling, uh, telling episode. Yeah. And there are people still today who are fighting that cause. Grieving, grieving for how the how the whole battle was. Yes. All these years later. My generalization is that any cause over which people have spilt blood in history, somebody somewhere is still ready to spill more blood. Nothing ever goes away. Or improves. <laughs> Thank you. Carolyn. You know, just interestingly, my daughter was just in Charlotte, North Carolina for two months doing a, um, an assignment for her degree. And um, she took a tour in Charlotte, jump on, jump off, and passing multiple Confederate monuments, which I was surprised were still standing. She said the way they describe um, the Civil War, they don't mention it. They say, um, remember the Northern aggression? And I thought that was a very interesting way to describe the Civil War. The War of Northern Aggression. The, yeah. the other term, uh, I grew up in the South, uh, was the war between the states. And the war between the states is an interesting term because it implies that there were two separate nation states. And that this yeah. was a war between two nations. Um, which grants the South the status of a nation uh, rather than a group of um, rebellious uh, rebellion. David. Uh, we're getting away from Waverly. A historian I've read says that in the first 50 years after the adoption of the Constitution, people writing used the United States are as often as they use the United States is. Mm -hmm. uh, for a long, long time in the 20th century, you couldn't sell a history textbook in the South if you used the term the Civil War in it. It had to be the war between the states. Yeah. 
or the war for Southern independence is what some of them held out for. It leaves an opening for you to put a chip on your shoulder and have to fight and draw more blood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, would you be interested in hearing about David Copperfield and Waverly? Um, uh, yes. yes. Yes, we, we spent some time on David Copperfield in earlier meetings of the Pickwick Club. And I have come to the belief that uh, Dickens was thinking in very specific ways about Waverley when he came to write David Copperfield. And that Waverley provides a kind of template uh, uh, for the character system. That's the term that I like to use. The disposition of characters, the distribution of characters in David Copperfield. And a strange way to enter this um, hypothesis is through the figure of Micawber. Um, what I would suggest is that Micawber is the character in David Copperfield who is related to the Baron of Bradwardine in Waverley. Both of them are comic characters. Both of them are pedantic. They're full of quotations. Both of them are long-winded. Um, but both of them end up playing a more important role in the novel than we would think that a minor character uh, would play. Um, Macabre does that by defeating Heap. He's the one who takes his sword, uh, that is his ruler, and um, beats Heap. The Baron does this early in the novel when he fights the duel uh, for, for David. So, you know, we might wonder in thinking about David Copperfield why uh, David isn't the one who defeats Heap. And after Heap is exposed, Heap turns on David and says, you're the one who did this. It's your, it's your fault. So Heap identifies David as the... But let me say some more things about Macabre. Macabre, uh, the name alone, is a trace of Scottishness. I think that uh, Wilkins Macabre is Mick Cobber, that MC name at the beginning is a trace of Scottishness. And his favorite authors are Scottish authors. He quotes several times from Burns. He um, uh, uh, quotes Old Lang Syne, the Burns poem. And at another point, he quotes from Rob Roy, the Walter Scott novel. So why does Dickens give Micawber these Traces of Scottishness. I, th I think that it's a clue through a minor character that there is a link between David Copperfield and Scott generally, but Waverley in particular. So where else is there a connection between um, David Copperfield and Waverley? Um, I think that the unheroic hero is a, another important link. I think David is very much like Edward in Waverly. He's largely clueless about what's going on around him. Um, he, he simply doesn't understand the world. And uh, Edward Waverly is, is very much the, uh, the same kind of character. I've talked about the, um, the fact that uh, Scott keeps, Scott's narrator keeps referring to him as our hero. Uh, remember the opening sentence of David Copperfield, whether I shall turn out to be the hero of my own life or whether that station will be held by anyone else, these pages must show. So the question of whether David is or is not a hero is, is very much at, at issue. Um, who is the hero of David's life? Well, I think eventually David becomes the hero of his own life. Um, 
we all become the heroes of our own lives. Uh, Edward is the hero in a sense of, of Waverly because the novel is about how he grows up. It's the story of his growing up. David Copperfield similarly is the story of David growing up. The main difference in structure, in form between Waverly and um, David Copperfield is that David tells his own story. So you don't have a narrator who has a different, an outside view of David. David's view of the world is entirely through David's own eyes. Now, a lot of Waverly is narrated from the perspective of Edward, but uh, there's also always the, the voice of, of the narrator that accompanies him. David's great mistake in life, he makes many mistakes, um, but one of them uh, is uh, that he uh, worships Steerforth. I think that David's infatuation with Steerforth is very similar to the way that Waverly Edward uh, turns Fergus into a romantic hero. I think that's perhaps the strongest similarity between, between the two novels. But if you think about some of the minor characters, I've already suggested that um, the Baron of Bradwardine is in a very loose sense. They're not similar at all, but in a very loose sense is, is akin to um, uh, the uh, uh, Micawber in, in David Copperfield. Um, Flora McIver uh, has a counterpart in David Copperfield. And that's Rosa Dartle. What's the connection to Rosa Dartle? Uh, she's Irish, she's a Celt, and she plays the harp, which is one of the features that uh, distinguishes uh, Flora McIver as well. Um, she's also fanatically devoted to her, what we might think of as her brother, that is to Fergus, uh, to, to Steerforth. So, um, even though she has been abused by him physically and perhaps even sexually, um, Rosa Dartle is a Steerforth loyalist. And in the same way, Flora is a Fergus loyalist. Um, Mr. Dick, Mr. Dick has a counterpart in Waverly and it's Davy Galatly. Davy is a fool but he's a wise fool. And Mr. Dick similarly is someone who is uh, represented as being mentally um, deficient or uh, 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 slow in her, his mental development, but he's also someone who has uh, wisdom of a certain sort. And David Galatly is someone who uh, turns out not to be as foolish as uh, uh, he uh, first appears. So I think that, that uh, Dickens was thinking about Scottish literature through Micawber, through, uh, through the quotes that Micawber has from Scott. And um, I think he was thinking about the, the distribution of, of characters in the novel, the ones who, um, not all of them, I, I don't think that uh, 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 Heap, for example, has a counterpart. Though Heap may have a counterpart in Rob Roy. Um, but what about the, the Pegatees? Uh, the Pegatees are a perfect example of the kind of peasant figure that Scott is very fond of. And in the novel, The Antiquary, there is a, uh, a family of fisher folk who represent the kind of salt of the earth um, family that the Pegatee family is in, uh, in, uh, in, in David Copperfield. So uh, if there is a difference, a political difference between the two novels, it's that I think Dickens is more sympathetic to uh, the common folk. I think that the Pegatees are the, the source of uh, the, the truest uh, feeling and moral integrity in David Copperfield. 
and that David's willingness to betray the Pegates by introducing Steerforth into their midst is a betrayal of the working class by a member of the middle class. And that David is in the end loyal to Steerforth more than he is to the Pegates. And at the end, I think that um, uh, Edward remains uh, nostalgic about his relationship with, uh, with, with Fergus. So these are just a few of the, the, the links that I see, but there, um, uh, you know, certainly there are many differences between the two novels, but uh, I think that there are surprising similarities. And I start with, with Macabre because I think uh, that's where the traces of Scottishness in the novel are, um, are clearest. Irene. Hi. I, I can see most of your parallels there and accept them. The one that I don't accept is the Rosa Darto one. The similarity I see is between Flora and Agnes. The opposite, in other words, the admirable characters uh, are, are the parallels because I see in Flora, her, the fact that she doesn't let David get entangled with her is what her, because she can see that it would not be to his benefit. She, do, she doesn't push him, she doesn't try to get him in, into the, the, she could easily have got him in, involved in the cause because she can see that he's infatuated with her. She doesn't. And Agnes, in the same way, doesn't make clear her feelings about David until right at the end, for similar reasons. So I see in those two things that he admires in women who can put aside their, what is of benefit to them and look at the needs of others. For me, Agnes is the Rose Bradwardine of the novel. She's the, uh, the appropriate mate for uh, David in the same way that Agnes is the appropriate mate for uh, for Edward. I would agree, but I sort of think that Rose is uh, just so so bland a character that, you know, and doesn't come to life at all. And I can't see her as any equivalent to either Flora or Agnes, who are lively characters in a way that Rose is, never is. Rose, Rose actually, I think, has a larger role and is a stronger character than um, than she seems to be at first. And the reason that I would say that is that uh, we learn that the rescue of Edward when he's being uh, carried by the Covenanters to a trial in London um, is, has actually been motivated by Rose, who has given money to Donald Bain Lane and encouraged him to rescue uh, David, or to, I get, I'm getting the novels, to rescue Edward. Um, and um, so she, I, I talked once before about the many people in the novel who are writing plots for Edward, that Fergus is writing a plot for him and uh, Sir Everard and uh, uh, everyone has a, has a story that they want to, you know, Talbot is, has a story that he wants to write for, for Edward. But Rose is also writing a, a plot for, for, for Edward. And it's a rescue plot that will free him up from his infatuation with, uh, with Flora. And uh, the other connection that I see is that uh, there's, no, there's no version of Dora in, in Waverly. Um, but there is this link that uh, Flora and Dora both perform a similar role in that both of them discourage David and, uh, and Edward and hand him on to the woman who's his proper mate. So, so Flora does that for Edward, hands him off to Rose because Flora has recognized that Rose is the is the right woman for him. And similarly, Dora, um, sweet loving Dora, uh, recognizes that uh, uh, Agnes is the proper mate for 
predated. So, and the similarities between Rosa Dartle and uh, and Flora are are distant. I I, I acknowledge that they're they're distant, but both of them are fanatics. Both of them are you know Flora is an idealist. You know she's uh, she's the romantic heroine. Rosa Dartle is in some ways the perversion uh, of that, and her her vicious attack on on Emily is uh, something that uh, uh, you know Flora would never uh, commit. I mean, actually, I think that Flora is the uh, is an admirable character. Uh, the fact that she's you know sort of totally devoted to the cause uh, is only uh, something unattractive if you take the Scott point of view that the you know, the whole cause sh is one that should not be supported. Uh, if you don't take that point of view, then Flora is totally admirable and totally devoted to the cause, and uh, but also not using other people in that uh, to do it as her hus as her brother does. Fergus is unadmirable, but his sister is admirable. And and there are many people who have have read and continue to read Flora in that way. And Flora Flora is the the perfect idealist. Um, she's too good for this world, and so she has to retreat to a convent at the end of. <laughs> of the novel. Um, but um, um, yes, Luca. Uh, my question, but just, just talk to it in this moment. Uh, does uh, uh, Scott make a sort of subversion of this uh, difference among the two women in uh, uh, Ivanov? with uh, uh, Rowena and uh, um, Rebecca. Rebecca. Uh, and so then uh, Thackeray make fun uh, of it, about this uh, subversion and this distinction. Uh, the idealist and the uh, sweet, sweet and idealist woman and the uh, Glacian woman. Yes, yes. And um, people have, um, have often commented on the the fact that Rebecca, the the Jewish character, the Jewish female character in uh, in Ivanhoe, is much more interesting and much more intelligent than uh, the blonde heroine, who's the uh, the one who will get incorporated into the the marriage plot. I think that uh, in Ivanhoe, that uh, Scott has developed greater irony toward uh, the 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 good heroine, if you will, than he does in in Waverly. I think I think in in Waverly, there's much that can be said on behalf of Rose, um, um, and uh, Rowena in uh, in Ivanhoe is is just a a, a figure, uh, a, a stick figure of of very little interest. Yes, David. Remember that Scott started writing novels when he was already middle-aged, and I think in many of his books, he's not very interested in the romantic fumblings of the young. <laughs> that's that's a good point, and and Scott's narrator uh, in when when he gets to the the marriage of of Edward and and Rose says. I'm not going to spend very much time on this because <laughs> I'm not really very interested in it. Um, and he's much more interested in the disposition of property than he is in the marriage plot. <laughs> That's where uh, his his true interest is. It, it's in it's in commerce and commercial relations. I'm wondering. Don't you for yourself, sorry. John? You once said that the 19th century novel is really all about money. Brad. Yes, you know, I'm interested too in this idea that you said your interest, uh, one of your primary interests in his development of the smaller characters um, and how he uses the smaller characters to carry the narrative forward. And, and I'm wondering if, and this is just, I don't know, I'm just asking, I'm wondering if it, if this is the beginning of the, the notion of a long long form storytelling, um, if you will, 
I mean, three volumes. I, I'm guessing that they were all published separately and, and all needed to be bought separately at various times, you know, much like a mini series today or, or, or some longer, bigger story that you just needed to develop a universe of characters that carried certain forces of the narrative into the future. Um, and and your, your, your acknowledgement, so you're pointing out that the comparisons or the similarities between Dickens and the characters in Dickens and the characters in Scott are, are just an affirmation of this notion of maybe for the first time, storytellers having to really thoroughly create a complicated universe to continually provide us with a surprise in the narrative to keep us intrigued and to keep us interested. Mm -hmm. Just wondering about that. No, really. that, I, I think that's a that's a perfectly apt observation. And um, just one one small thing to say about the form of publication: the three volumes would have been published all at the same time, but the utility of the three volume format is the lending library, because when you go to the lending library, you check out volume one, and then when you're finished, you give it to your sister. And then you read volume two, and then you hand that on. So the um, you know the the novel is not a an eight hundred page penguin of the kind that that we buy at our local bookstore. It's this smaller format that you can share with someone else because you're getting it from a lending library. Just one one follow, if I could. One of the concerns that I think about fiction is the the dilemma of surprise that in, in narrative, for us to stay interested and to us not to sit there, you know, tapping our feet, waiting for the author to do what we know they're going to do, we have to be surprised. And I think that becomes the, the, the ultimate trick that the, the writer or the author has to continue to create as time goes on. And I would think that would be part of his great trick, if you will, forgive the, the, the characterization, but that he created so many interesting characters that always turned back on us and surprised us that that would keep us interested. It, part of the trick, I mean, trick is, uh, it's the art, uh, the artifice of, of, of the novel is the recurring character, the character who's going to come back and surprise us because um, there's no particular reason why that character should come back, but it turns out that that character comes back and actually has something important to say or something important to do. And, um, and then there's the surprise that comes with the introduction of a new character late in the story. So Talbot shows up um, late, late in the story and has a crucial role to play. Um, one last thought I want to leave you with, and um, this occurred to me this morning as I was thinking about um, the ending of, of Waverly. And Fergus meets his death in a particularly horrible way. I mean, he's beheaded and his head is, is uh, stuck on the spikes of the city gates. Um, and he's condemned to death for the crime of treason. Why doesn't Edward get accused of treason. And I was thinking of the American soldier, um, uh, Bagdoll, I think was his name, who defected from the American army and went to the Taliban and um, was a prisoner, or perhaps, uh, you know, complicit. Bergdahl. With the, Bergdahl. Bergdahl. Bergdahl, yes, that's the, that's the name, that's the name. Um, Bergdahl's story of going over to the Taliban is remarkably similar to what happened to Edward. Why doesn't Edward get accused of treason? Why doesn't why did his head end up on the on the city gates? What is it that saves him? Aside from the fact that he's our hero. He had better connections. He had better connections. He had a better lawyer. He had Talbot on his side. Yeah. But I was thinking it's his class. 
It's yeah. his class. Yes. Yes. So he's all right because he belongs to a good class, you know. Yes, exactly. But he's English, not Scottish. And he Fergus English. had a higher class than he did, but Fergus was, uh, you know, hung, drawn, and quartered. <laughs> Yeah. But, uh, your class didn't save you with being English and of the right class. Saved oh. English and the right class. Yes. Yeah. The combination. <laughs> That's <laughs> the winning combination. There you are. <laughs> oh. Fascinating. Anyway, an interesting modern um, parallel to um, yes. the situation. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much for letting me join. I <laughs> hope you could be awesome. here. That's great. Thank you. Just thank you, everyone. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, John. That was <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>